Chapter 15, Our First Pastorate When I was 21, my wife and I went with our pastor to speak with the district elder about taking a pastorate while attending Taylor University. He had informed me prior to this time that there were three pastorates available. I was to make my choice at this time. As I listened to my elder describe the opportunities, I was trusting Jesus to help me know which one to choose. You may have this one particular pastorate, he explained, which is close to Taylor University and pays $800 a year. This other one is farther away and has two parsonages. You may rent one and have a little more income. It also pays $800. He paused as if waiting for my answer, and I said, Sir, you told me that there would be a choice of three pastorates. A bit reluctantly, he replied, The third one is Red Key Circuit. It pays only $700 a year. The moment he said Red Key Circuit, I knew that was where God wanted us. I could tell in my heart. Red Key Circuit is where we are to be, I informed him. This man was many years my senior and had preached for a long while. But when I told him my decision, he asked, Why didn't you choose this pastor at near Taylor University? It is much more convenient and pays $100 more a year. Of course, $100 was a sizable sum at that time. You have answered too quickly, he suggested. Give it some thought for 24 hours. It will never change, I assured him. What God tells me never changes. He replied, You call back in 24 hours to give me your final decision. The following day, I phoned the district elder to tell him, We will go to Red Key Circuit. This charge consisted of two congregations, and the parsonage had neither a bathroom nor a furnace. In terms of human comfort and strength of membership, it could have been considered one of the least desirable pastorates of the district, if not the least. But this is where God witnessed that we were to be. We began our work there in April of 1937. After we had been there six weeks, one of the dear praying women told my wife, I have prayed for your husband's ministry in this church for 30 years. That meant that eight and a half years before I was born, she had been praying for the work which God was doing through me. What if I had failed to seek God's will, had not gone where he had directed, and had missed this sacred appointment for which this dear one had prayed for these many years? When Florence and I started, we had little with which to furnish a parsonage. My father had bought us a small green couch which pulled out at the bottom and made into twin beds. Florence slept on the soft side and I slept on the hard side. That was our bed from 1934 to 1936. In 1937, we purchased our first regular bed with the $17.50 I had saved since childhood. Unfortunately, it was not a very good one. And before too long, neither of us was sleeping well. The mattress gave way, and both of us ended up in the middle. But we were thankful for it. While praying beside this old couch in December of that year, God revealed to me, I want you to have a meeting with your board of evangelism. Tell them that you are going to have a revival. When I spoke to the board, however, the two leading men told me, We can't have revival. We don't have the money. We couldn't raise $10 from the entire congregation. I hadn't thought of that. Well, I informed them, God tells me to have revival. The precious mother who had prayed for my ministry, the only woman on the board, spoke up. Reverend Helm is right. God wants revival. The other two men expressed themselves by saying, We are on the fence, meaning I could have revival if I wanted, and if I didn't, that was all right too. Returning home, I went to prayer. I was only 21 in my first assignment as pastor. I didn't want to do anything that I shouldn't. 
My board of evangelism was not in agreement. One thought we should have revival, two were definitely opposed and two were undecided. Jesus, I prayed, what will I do? As I sought the Lord's guidance, he clearly directed me to call an evangelist in Richmond, Indiana. I was to ask him to arrive early Sunday morning for prayer, after which he could preach for me as guest speaker. Jesus said, You leave it all to me, which I did. Early Sunday morning, the evangelist and I had a little prayer meeting before he preached. When the altar call was given, down the aisle came Arthur and Mrs. Brown. They prayed through, were converted, and the entire congregation agreed, this is revival. Less than one year later, Mrs. Brown lay in her casket. How important God's guidance for revival was to this precious soul. Those special services lasted three weeks, the Lord guiding and helping. Forty-five were saved or sanctified, and bodies were healed. God did miracles among us. My wife still recalls that as one of the most wonderful revivals she has ever been in. We had 25 to 28 in Sunday school at that time. When the power fell on that small congregation, the attendance soon doubled and continued to increase. Jesus had told me, You leave it all to me. He was the one who performed it. At this young beginning, I did not believe in divine healing. The evangelist, on the other hand, declared, God heals today just like he always did. Is that right? I remarked. I had heard about my father being healed when he was a boy, but I was still a young man and had no experience with healing. God is still the same, the evangelist assured me. That's wonderful, I told him. When he shared that God still healed as he did in Bible times, I began to believe him. As it happened, one of the women in our congregation, Edna C., had been in a very serious accident and suffered severe pain almost constantly. Because of a fractured pelvis and some fractured vertebra, she had to be turned in a sheet for three weeks. The evangelist learned of it and said to me one day, Let's go out to the home of these folks and have a little meeting. We'll anoint this woman with oil and ask God to heal her. It will stir the countryside for Jesus. When I asked Edna for her permission to come, she gladly consented. About a dozen of my laymen accompanied us there that day. After singing Amazing Grace and a few other hymns, the evangelist and I moved to the side of the bed, anointed the suffering woman with oil, and began to call to our Heavenly Father to come down and heal her. In the midst of the prayer, I saw a ray of light descend from heaven, and the glory of God fell all over the room in great sweetness. I looked over at Edna's husband, a man weighing 200 pounds or more, and God was moving so upon him that he was literally shaking. The power of God hit my wife, and she shouted, I never saw her rejoice like that before or since. She had no idea that she was going to do it. But when the power of God came, it simply brought the shout right out of her. We are so unaccustomed to God's Spirit being in evidence today that few of us know how great His power actually is. When He comes in a mighty awakening one of these days, everyone will know it. He will move everybody whether they want to be moved or not. Oh, the glory of God that filled that room. Jesus went into Edna's body, immediately healing the fractured pelvis and the injured vertebra. In an instant, God performed a miracle. When we all left, her elderly aunt came into the room. Will you please get my clothes? Edna asked her. Oh, Edna, she cautioned. You are a sick woman. You wouldn't want to try getting up. You mean I was sick, Edna told her. Please go get my clothes, because I am going to get dressed and come help you prepare the evening meal. Oh, child, you aren't well. You are sick. You mean I was. I want to get up out of this bed. 
I want to go to church tomorrow night. But Edna, the aunt insisted, you are in bad shape. I was in bad shape, auntie, she explained again. I am not now. I am well. And she got up out of bed. The dear relative was so startled. After Edna dressed, she helped her aunt prepare the evening meal, and the next night came to church. When this woman, who had been painfully confined to a turning sheet for three weeks, stood up and witnessed to the miracle of Jesus healing her, people were moved for God in that community. This was my first experience in divine healing, and God made it unmistakably clear to me that he is just the same today as he was when Jesus walked this earth. By God's grace, I shall never forget it. God also performed a miracle for Mabel P., who had been unable to lie down because of a certain infection in her respiratory system. Upon occasions, a bloody mucus would start up out of her lungs and choke her, so she was forced to try to rest sitting up. We took a few of our laymen to pray for her. As we started to pray, somehow God helped me to know that everything was not quite right. Something is hindering prayer, I said. There is something in the way. People are not right with God. I then asked the people to pray for themselves. Get right with God, I would plead. Still, I could not pray for Sister P's healing. I cried out some more. There is something in somebody's heart that is holding back the power. Isn't it amazing that God could show a young and inexperienced pastor the need of the moment? I continued to plead with the people to get right in their hearts. It was not an easy place. Finally, after about three or four exhortations, two women came across that living room and asked one another's forgiveness. The channels of love were unblocked and the glory fell. We began to pray, and Mabel said that she saw Jesus standing in the gate of heaven. As we were interceding for her, she saw Jesus reach his hand down from heaven, put it on her head, and heal her. But as soon as she was healed, this thick, bloody mucus began to flow out of her mouth. Quickly we had to get a container. All my people were alarmed. I could see by their faces that they doubted. Have faith, I encouraged them. This is the unclean coming out. It was a terrible sight. I have never seen such a substance pouring out of a person's mouth and throat. Don't disbelieve, I kept telling them. Just have faith and say, thank you, Jesus. Why, who told me that? What made me so certain that this was of God when the older people were fearful that she wasn't healed? It had to be Jesus helping me, I know. When she visited the doctor for x-rays, he said, This is wonderful. All that infection is gone from your lungs. Jesus had healed her for his glory. These are but a few of the marvelous things we would have missed in our first pastorate if we had made our own choice rather than God's choice. My district elder had been thinking of my finances when he recommended the better paying positions. But look at the power of God which was able to operate once we arrived where God ordained us to be. And the Holy Ghost is moving through my body now as I share this with you. This was only the beginning of what God was going to accomplish for His glory because it was His beginning and not mine.